once a ravishing home to rich politicians, but a bitter prison for 800 slaves. This is the middle place. What stories does it tell, and why is it important to know them? We think of slavery as a thing of the past. Lincoln, emancipation, slavery is long gone. But hear this. If it was $50,000 to buy a slave, now an average cost to buy a person is a meager $90. Human life is cheaper than ever, and although not legal, slavery is still alive. So, plantations like this hold a vital key to understanding slavery, human nature, and survival. They're precious artifacts that show the lives of fallen heroes who built this country. And for me, for an outsider, this was simply a chance to understand America and its people. And after all, I'm in Charleston, in a city formerly known as the Amazon Prime of American slavery. If not here, then where else? I was also intrigued by how Middleton Place was gonna tackle this issue. Most plantations struggle to tell a nuanced story about that shameful period. Is it gonna whitewash and sugarcoat it, or be unbearably and brutally honest? This is tremendous work of hundreds of men and women in chains. Elegant gardens like the Royal Palace of Versailles, with moody sculptures, deep hidden alleys. You think you're somewhere in Europe. Even Mel Gibson filmed The Patriot here. You can imagine rich aristocrats having lavish balls and exquisite dinners, talking about politics. And no wonder the previous owners were politicians and state governors. One even signed the Declaration of Independence. What a paradox! They certainly didn't think of slavery when signing on all men being created equal. Instead, the Middletons enslaved 3,500 people on 19 plantations. Well, without slave labor, they wouldn't have been deciding the fate of the nation. The Middleton place was a failure, and it only turned into a vicious money machine when the enslaved from West Africa used their knowledge to grow gold. And by gold, I mean the Carolina gold rice. And over here we have a tool called a lathe. Oh, it's a great little lathe, a two-man operation. One man turned the crank while the other did the cutting. Uh, they could turn out balusters for staircases and have the wagon this. Every single bit of this was done by enslaved Africans, people who brought wood carving tools that were with them, and they were the ones who brought the knowledge of rice that they had grown in Africa for hundreds of years and the English knew very little about. <laughs> which made for a very interesting situation of slaves teaching their owners something about the growing of rice. Hiding underneath the water, the notorious rice fields. That might just as well be a cemetery. Because here, the enslaved worked in mosquito-infested swamps up to 20 hours a day, digging holes with bare hands and feet, only to die from heat, yellow fever, and malaria. There's a saying that Carolina in the spring is a paradise, in the summer a hell, and in the autumn a hospital. So, to grow rice and make tons of money, planners paid big bucks for skilled people from the rice coast. If you see that Mingo was sold at 500, a high price at that time, he must have been a guy in his prime of life, healthy and strong, he might have been planning to get married and have kids, but got captured on his own turf by his own people. Crazy that Africans in Africa sold their enemies, or even family members, in exchange for money and guns. They even specifically hunted for people with special skills, such as carpenters, cooks, or blacksmiths. If you look up at the chandelier there, you see it in the middle. That's what we call a basket twist or a cage twist. And we'll come out looking more like that big one over there. 
So the more air adds to the fire, the hotter it gets. A given idea of temperatures, the forge can reach up to about 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, which feels fantastic on days like this. Planners paid top dollar for blacksmiths, as they did a crucial job. They made various tools needed for life on the plantation. Hoes, plows, hinges, even utensils. They usually learned the ropes from their fathers. And although the Carolina law did not allow families and marriages between slaves, the Middletons even encouraged it. But if you think it was out of kindness, no. That way, they were just less likely to run away. Another way to make people less likely to run away was religion. Planners thought that Christianity would make people easier to control and silence rebellions. As Lenin would say, religion was used as the opium of the people. This might look like a small shaggy cabin with a couple of benches and a podium. But for the enslaved, what it represented was big. It was an escape, a shelter where they sang and prayed, trying to hold on to things they couldn't be taken away from, their beliefs culture, and knowledge. Clear evidence of their skills and knowledge are these intricately woven baskets. Not only were they useful for processing rice, but for the enslaved, they were also a source of artistic pride. Now you can see their descendants, the Gula Geechee people, selling the sweetgrass baskets and in the round Charleston. But of course, contributions of millions of enslaved aren't only seen in baskets. Starting from the food you eat, land you walk on, to music you listen to, a sweat and tears of Retta, Eliza, Harriet, Quaco, Toby, Mingo. But sadly, there's still so much needed to be said, to be uncovered and traced. And for that, the Middleton Place is a good starting point. It can be first steps towards finding your identity, your roots, or towards discussion and healing. <laughs>